Hello and welcome to my channel. In my last video, I showed you how to create a very simple user registration form that also allowed the user to sign in, and we did this using an SQLite database. In today's video, we're going to take a look at social authentication using Google. Now, because this process is pretty easy, we won't be using a library, rather we'll be coding the process ourselves. And once we're able to do this using Google, we can replicate this process for other platforms such as Facebook or even GitHub. And if you're interested in the code, you'll find a link to my GitHub repository in the description, and that will include the code from the previous video as well as this video. Okay, so now let's get started. So the first thing that we need to do is create a project on the Google Auth platform. And you can do this simply by clicking on the clients menu and then creating a new client. From there, you need to select the web application type and then further down, you need to specify the redirect URL. Now let's take a quick moment to understand how the process works. When a user clicks on the sign in with Google button, they are redirected to a Google authentication page and the link that they click on contains a client ID. And this link looks like this. It contains several required parameters. So here the client ID is obtained when you create a Google Auth client and this ID can be shared publicly. Now the redirect URI is the location that the user is going to get redirected to after they authenticate your app. And in this redirect, Google is going to add a code parameter to the URL. So we need to take this code parameter and exchange it for an access token. And then using the access token, we can issue a separate request to get the user's profile information. But this is only going to be possible because of the scope that we've selected. So here you can see the scope parameter includes two scopes, email and profile. And these two scopes are separated by a space. So essentially using these two scopes, the user is going to have to give permission for your app to use their profile information as well as their email address. Now, since we're only developing a social authentication system, these are the only two scopes that we need. So now that we know how the process works, let's go ahead and start writing some code. But before we start, let's take a quick look at the cargo file to see what dependencies we need to get this all working. So the only additional libraries that we've included since the last video is the Axum Web Framework, the Tokyo Runtime and the Request Create to make HTTP requests. Now, if you take a look at Axum and Tokyo, you'll notice that they are both marked as optional. So we have to add them as dependencies to the server. OK, so the first thing that we need to do is create a route that's going to be used as the redirect endpoint. Now, we can't use server-side functions for this because a server-side function is essentially an AJAX call. And what we need to do is set up a route that can be accessed via GET request. And so to get this to work, we need to drill down to the Axum layer of our Dioxys application. And this is done by re-implementing the main function. Now, as you're aware, we can't have two main functions running in our program, but we can use the CFG attribute to add conditional compilation to our code. So here you can see I'm using the CFG attribute to set the feature to server so that this main function will only get compiled for the server. So now we can go ahead and add the code that we need to launch Dioxys using the Axum Web Framework. And if you take a look at line 15, you'll notice that we've added a route to handle the redirect location. Now, the whole point of re-implementing this main function is just to be able to add this route. Now, there is another way to do this using Dioxys' routing system, and that is to create a client-side route where we can extract the code parameter from the URL and then issue a separate request to continue with the process. And you can see an example of this in my next video. For now, let's go ahead and continue with the server-side routing. Okay, so now we have a main function that's going to get compiled for the server, but we also have a previous main function. And this function is also going to get compiled both for the server and for the client. So to stop this from happening, we need to add the CFG attribute with the not attribute to specify that this main function is only going to get compiled for the client. Now in this example, I've used the not attribute, but we can also rewrite it as feature is equal to web and remove the not attribute and that should also work. Now when it comes to using full stack development using Dioxys, if you're working on anything other than a simple project, you'll find that you're going to constantly have to use the CFG attribute. And this is especially true when you're working with sensitive data. Now let's take a look at the main UI component, but more specifically the Google sign in button. And this sign in button is really just a link that navigates to Google's auth API using a client ID that we can obtain when we create a Google auth project. So once you create the Google auth client, as you saw earlier, you'll get a client ID and a client secret as seen in this screen. And so we need to provide this client ID to essentially identify our app. Now take a look at the URL and you'll notice that we need to provide the redirect URI and also the scope that we want access to. Now the client ID and the redirect URL are both set up as global variables, but at some point we also need the client secret. So let's go ahead and set this up as well. Now because the client secret is essentially a secret, we don't want to expose it to the front end. So we need to mark it with the CFG attribute because without it, the client secret will get compiled into the web assembly. So someone could go ahead and view the source code and they'll be able to see your secret causing you a whole lot of problems. So always remember to protect your code using the CFG attribute using the server feature when necessary. And so finally, we get to the main part of the code, the function that takes the Google Auth code that's returned in the redirect and processes it. Now, to help make this part of the video clear, let's go through this function step by step as though it was a code review. So we start by extracting the code from the query string using Axum's query string extractor. And we extract all the query parameters into a hash map so we can use an if statement to check if the code parameter exists. 
And if the code exists, we can move on to the next step, which is to get a token using the code as well as the client ID and the client secret. But we also have to provide the redirect URI and the grant type. These two parameters are required. And one thing to note here is that the content type is not application JSON. So we're not providing it as a JSON object, but it's going to be as an application form instead. Now it's important that we handle the result return from the post request because we could have a situation where the code has expired and therefore we're not going to get a valid token. But assuming we've acquired a valid token, we can then use that token to issue a request to get the user's profile data. And once we have the user's profile data, we can then create an account for that user. But before we do that, we should really check if that user already exists. So here we're querying the user's table using the email address that's returned with the profile data. But notice that we're also using the provider field as an additional constraint. And this is so that we don't get a conflict if a user has registered on the website using the same email address that they have for their Google account. And it also gives us some flexibility to add other social authentication platforms such as Facebook, Instagram or GitHub. Now if this query returns a result, we know that the user exists so we can continue to log them in and create a session for them. Now session management is outside the scope of this video, but there are plenty of libraries out there that can help you do this. And hopefully at some point in the future when I start to cover other ROS topics, I'll show you how to create your own in-memory database server. Now getting back to the code, if the user doesn't exist, we can go ahead and create their account. And once the account has been created, we can then continue with the session management. And with that, we now come to the end of this video. Most social authentication platforms work on a similar basis. So if you're able to do it for one, you're able to do it for the others. Okay, so thank you all for watching. If you found this video useful, please consider giving it a like and I'll see you all on the next video.